In the last 24 hours, 10 as of this morning remaining in intensive care, with 18 remaining in hospital overall. Uh, and then just briefly in terms of clusters, 455 notified in respect of residential care facilities, 255 of which are in respect of nursing homes, and the case numbers associated with those, 7,308 in respect of residential care facility residents, 5,760 in respect of residents of nursing homes. And I'm just going to hand over at this point to Philip. Thanks, Philip. Okay, so just by, to start, um, you, you've seen this slide each week, uh, just emphasizing again uh, the very low levels of disease in the, in the wider population. So reporting very low numbers of new cases. And as uh, the chief medical officer has just pointed out, uh, very low numbers in hospital and in intensive care. Uh, just looking at the table in more detail, comparing uh, the five-day average um, from yesterday, uh, the 1st of July, with the five-day average on the preceding, the Wednesdays of the preceding week. Uh, just to start, and I'll come back to it, uh, a slightly higher number of cases being confirmed each day on average at 13, uh, compared with nine last week, which we've seen this before. If you look at the preceding two weeks, we went from 17, uh, to 19. So this may just be a transient short event, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, the number of tests coming back positive, the number of tests being done is increasing, uh, particularly with targeted testing uh, in, in nursing home and residential care, but the, the positivity rate continues to decline. Uh, the number of people in hospital on average uh, over the last week has been 21, uh, uh, 18 today. Uh, very few admissions, um, that's down from, from 40 in, in, in the preceding week. Um, very few admissions, one or two per day. Uh, on average, 12 people in intensive care and one admission every five days, um, 10 today. And uh, sadly, still confirming uh, one or two deaths on average per day. So uh, all of the indicators continuing to decline and the numbers of cases, I'd say overall the best way to present it is that it's stable. Uh, as I said, the number of tests being done on average per day over the last week has increased because of that targeted testing, uh, but the proportion of those tests coming back positive, very low indeed at 0.3% uh, compared, for instance, with back in mid-April where we were looking at almost 20% of tests coming back positive. Just to look more closely at the confirmed cases, you'll be aware uh, this bar chart is showing the number of cases confirmed each day uh, for the last several weeks, the week beginning on Monday and the Wednesday where we take the five-day average highlighted in orange. Uh, you'll remember that over last Thursday, Friday and Saturday there was a, a larger than usual number of cases reported and again on Monday and that brought up the average this week compared to last week. Uh, we think that that, as I say, is a transient event, it's settling back down. I don't think it's marking uh, a trend for cases to increase. If you look at the total number of cases last week, 61, it's lower than the total number of cases reported in the preceding week. And then if we look more closely at the confirmed tests, um, so that's the, the black line, we can see the numbers of new cases confirmed each day increasing towards the latter part of last week but perhaps beginning to decline again in the opening part of this week. Uh, if we look at positive tests, we see obviously the tests are done earlier than the cases are confirmed. Uh, we see earlier in the week uh, an increase in the number of positive tests coming back, and again, that seems to have stabilized or declining. And if we look back at the positive test by the date the swab was taken, which would be a day or two earlier again, that's the green line. We begin to see it increase early in the week and uh, stabilizing now. So all in all, we think we had uh, uh, some additional reported cases last week, at the end of last week, and uh, a stable number this week. Just to confirm, looking back over the entire epidemic, we, we have a very robust uh, uh, testing regimen. Uh, in recent days, as I've said, this is the five-day average, numbers of tests increasing, numbers of positive uh, uh, detections, or, sorry, proportion of positive detections decreasing. We watch the growth rate very carefully, so comparing each day uh, with the previous day is the number of cases growing or declining. Uh, you'll remember that was about 33% increase per day early in the epidemic. When you've got very small numbers of cases, uh, for instance, if you had two cases one day and four cases the next, that would be a 100% increase. 
So this fluctuates up and down uh, in the course of, of the recent weeks, but it is on average uh, fluctuating around zero. In other words, uh, the number of new cases per day is not growing if you look back over the last few weeks. And I say that for a reason, which I'll come back to in a minute. The, the growth rate is very closely related to the reproduction number, and I, I'll, I'll come to the reproduction number at the very end. Where are the cases emerging? That really is very uh, steady over the last couple of weeks, between 40 and 60% of cases uh, in uh, isolated household or family settings, um, and the rest in uh, long-term residential care, a small number. Healthcare workers, a very stable number, uh, a very stable proportion. Uh, and the remaining in other uh, outbreaks, including travel-related outbreaks, which I will come to in a moment. This is the age distribution of cases across the entire epidemic. The, the light blue is that 20 to 39-year-old bracket, and you'll see in the middle, in, in April, uh, younger people accounted for a very small fraction of overall cases. Uh, in recent weeks, as the numbers of cases in total uh, declines that that becomes a little bit more noisy but you can see from that blue band spreading out uh, that over the last two weeks we have seen an increasing proportion of that smaller number of cases being amongst younger people and then finally travel for the last four weeks uh, we've seen the proportion of cases uh, attributable to travel uh, increase steadily uh, so that over the test done last week 19% uh, of positive tests coming back last week were travel or travel related. They weren't all acquired by international travel, uh, half or perhaps slightly less than half uh, were acquired internationally and the other half are related to people being infected by that traveler coming into or returning the country, returning to the country and infecting somebody else. In absolute terms, so it's not just the proportion obviously, in absolute terms, uh, the number of travel related cases uh, is increasing again. Uh, we were looking at 70 or 80 per week in the very early stage of, of the epidemic, very low numbers in the middle, and we're back up to the low teens now in terms of the, uh, the number of travel-related cases uh, we're seeing. And as has been mentioned in other circumstances, that is a source of concern. And finally then, in relation to the reproduction number, with all of the caveats, we're looking at very low case numbers, uh, we're looking at the fact that towards the end of last week, we seem to have had a transient increase in newly reported cases, which has settled down. Our different estimates of reproduction number are giving us slightly different answers. Uh, these different estimates, some of them have very long memories. They look back over the last couple of weeks. Uh, some of them are dated to a period of time, uh, uh, 10 days or so, when the infections occurred. Um, the imperial model is actually looking at the number of deaths and inferring an R number from those. So those estimates uh, show us that reproduction number uh, could be as low as, as, as 0.6, but more recent estimates based on taking all the data together uh, show that it's equally likely that it's rising more close to one, in particular uh, influenced by those increased case detections in the last week. The estimate for this week uh, suggests that it could be around one with quite a wide confidence interval from as low as 0.7 to as high as 1.5. So the, the best way to look at this is if we take all of these in the round, it suggests that there has been uh, a, an increase in reproduction number over the course of the last week or two weeks from a low of around 0.5 uh, to a high which could be close to one, but it's equally likely that that will settle down in the course of the next week and if uh, cases don't continue to rise or even fall, that we'll be back next week saying, looking at this overall, that reproduction number has remained below one for this entire period. So a possible uh, a transient increase in this measure and we'll just have to wait uh, for the next few days uh, to see if that stabilizes. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot. Sinead Crowley from RTE News. Can I ask you about schools, please? There was some information reported yesterday that schools had been given um, guidance that they should be one metre apart or children should stay one metre apart and different guidance for different age groups. What information can you give us on that, please? That's been published. I mm. guess the guidance is infection prevention control guidance that was published by the Health Protection Surveillance Centre and it's intended, obviously, to be one part of a wider uh, suite of guidance that will be 
developed and published and used by the Department of Education to inform uh, the wider approach. I think the, the guidance is fairly clear. It, I think it's tried to take a pragmatic approach. Um, and as with all of the guidance that's been developed across all sectors, um, it's interim, it's subject to review depending on the evidence. Hopefully, uh, as we've said throughout, particularly in relation to children, the evidence as we go on uh, will uh, give us further reassurance that in fact uh, this disease affects children less severely and that perhaps children play less of a role in transmission when compared with how they, with the role they play in relation to seasonal influenza, for example. Um, but as I say, it'll be kept under review. The guidance reflects our current epidemiology in Ireland um, at this present time. So, and that, is that the one metre? And also, I believe there was a suggestion that younger children wouldn't have to have the young metre or wouldn't be able to, to stick to the one metre. So I think there was a pragmatic acceptance that young children in national school are unlikely to socially distance at all times. Um, the guidance, however, is clear that where possible, uh, that one metre should be kept and that children should be encouraged to socially distance and to take on all of the other measures that we're recommending. Uh, I know and I fully accept and understand that uh, these questions come down to the issue of distance and I fully understand the reasons for that in the context of the school environment in particular. But this again is about a range of different measures that children and teachers and parents can take uh, ultimately to keep the children and the teachers and the parents safe. Mm. And I know you have to base it on the information you have at the moment, but teachers are trying to plan for September. I mean, is it likely that this will change or can you see that this is changing or is there any advice that you can give people who are, who are trying to plan for something that's eight weeks ahead? I think people have to plan on the basis of the guidance that was published yesterday. Um, we would hope over time that that guidance might change, but we would not see it changing fundamentally uh, in its essence over the coming six to eight weeks. And of course, again, there's a caveat. We're in a very good position today versus where we were a number of weeks ago. There's nothing to say, unfortunately, uh, that we won't go in the other direction uh, over time. The virus is still out there. Again, we don't have a treatment. We don't have a vaccine. The vast majority of the population um, is still susceptible. Um, so the guidance is intended to be um, pragmatic it's to help teachers, to help the Department of Education, to help parents prepare as best we can in the context of an ongoing pandemic. Um, of course, if, if things can be made easier over time, of course we'll do that. But at this point in time, uh, the guidance is intended first and foremost to keep children and teachers safe. Mm. So even though some people are saying they, they want to see all the schools back or they want to see the schools back as normal, that's still with that one metre guidance and that's, that's certainly how things are at the moment even though there's a desire, obviously, f from a lot of people to have the schools fully back. Fully accept that there's a desire. Everybody would, wants society in its entirety to return to normal. Nobody wants us to be in this position. Um, but a balance has to be truck, struck with safety. And the guidance, I think, tries to do that. It's pragmatic and it says that, particularly for younger children, uh, that, the, that whilst one metre at least is preferable, that that should not preclude younger children from going back to school. And that's based, again, on the, uh, our evolving understanding of this disease, particularly in children. Um, but again, distance in itself does not protect someone. It's distance combined with hand hygiene, um, combined with the length of time that you're in someone's presence, combined with the, all of the other measures that you take. Thank you. And can I ask you one question about travel then, which obviously is the other thing occupying a lot of people's minds. You neff it met today. I'm judging by your comments in the press release and what you've said today. Are you still very concerned about travel and what sort of advice are you giving the government now that they are looking towards possible air bridges, which they discussed before? So there's ongoing work in relation to that and ongoing work across government and government I know is going to be considering that over the course of the coming days and we'll feed our advice and guidance into that in the way that we always do. Um, the situation is an evolving one. Uh, we look at the 14-day cumulative incidents, uh, as other countries do. Uh, the, the most recent calculation that we've done uh, as a country has shown continued improvement in relation to that. Uh, there are countries that are below us, perhaps, in terms of their incidence, but where there has been disimprovement, there are countries above us, uh, substantially above us. Our rate now is down below 2.5 per 100,000, if you look at the, the, the date of, uh, uh, of sampling, if you like, within the last 14 days. Uh, and that shows that we're at a very, very low level. What we'd like to be in is in a position where we can have, with countries where we can verify uh, and are satisfied that there are very low levels of transmission. 
uh, arrangements in place that, that uh, in effect, in terms of the movement of people between those two populations, assuming the process of movement itself is safe uh, and, 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 and uh, appropriately observes the public health advice, in other words, the actual movement on a plane, for example, or on a ship, uh, that uh, if, if we know that it's to a country and we can verify where the incidence is below a level or below ours, uh, then, then that couldn't, couldn't contribute increased uh, transmission risk over and above the transmission risk that exists within this country. Um, but there are many, many countries that are not in that situation. And the list of countries that are in that situation is subject to, uh, to change. So we gave, ongoing, we gave, we gave as, as, as we do, ongoing consideration to that question um, at the NEFIT meet, meeting today. Uh, and we're still concerned and, and cautious about the risk that is associated with travel outside of this country, which is why uh, we continue to emphasize the, the risks associated with non-essential travel and, and uh, uh, advise people to avoid uh, non-essential travel. We keep uh, that work uh, that, that we've described on a cross-government basis at a European level. We, keep, we will keep contributing to that to try to find means where we, we, we think we can uh, assure ourselves in relation to the, the low risks of it that we could actually see airline uh, uh, and, and international uh, travel happening between countries. We're not at a point yet where, we, where, where that work is complete and, uh, and it's ongoing. And for that reason, uh, we, we'll be very cautious about this. As Professor Nolan has demonstrated, we see now travel-related cases uh, making up an increasing share of the total number of cases that we've had. Uh, and some of the experiences that we've had with some of those imported cases shows that, just like uh, uh, we've, we've always known with this disease, uh, it, a small number of cases can quickly lead to additional spread and a larger number of cases occurring here. So we've had a cluster uh, in associated with association with uh, travel outside of this country. Uh, and a small number of additional cases leading to additional spread here will be the means through which, as we continue to improve the transmission of the virus that we're seeing here, that will be the means through which we'll see um, um, uh, us running into difficulty. Uh, so we have to be, from a public health point of view, um, um, uh, the only responsible thing we can do is to express continuing caution uh, around uh, international uh, travel. And is that all international travel? At, the, at this moment in time, until we're in a situation where we believe we have a list of countries, a, a so-called green list, where we can verify and we know that they're below a certain level. Uh, and that's the work that we're, we're trying to do at this moment in time, to be able to have arrangements in place. Because what we want to be able to do, and, and if you look at what we've done in terms of easing of social restrictions in this country, we've tried where we can, we can uh, minimize the risks, uh, give assurance to ourselves around the minimization of those risks, give information to people about how they can manage their own risks, to, to, to cautiously open up activity of the kind that we used to have before this virus came. Uh, and that will apply in time to international travel in the same way as it applied to social activity, economic activity, and other things that are happening here. A cautious approach, one that's informed by evidence, one that's informed by science, um, and one that ultimately will give information to people uh, so that they can take informed decisions about their own risks and uh, that we move from across all of the areas where we have recommendations to a situation where people understand the nature of their own risks, how to manage those risks and minimize them, and to empower them to take appropriate decisions, and that we move away from where we had during the course of the, 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 the last couple of months, restrictions in place where essentially the decisions are being made for us each as individuals, because, for example, restaurants are closed, if I just choose that as an example. Restaurants are now open, but on a certain basis where we can assure ourselves that the arrangements are in place, minimize the increased risk that exists in those settings. There is an increased risk, but we think it's an appropriate time to take some of those calculated risks because the transmission of the virus is low. And that's the same, if you like, in principle approach that we take to, to every sector and any recommendations that we make in relation to it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Tony Shane Beattie from News Talk. Um, if the green list was to be published today, could you give us examples of what countries would be on it? No, I don't think there's any point in doing that because like the green list will become operational at a point and there will be countries on that list and that's the one that we'll, we'll focus on. I'm just, it'll be uh, maybe not hypothetical, but, but the, a list of countries that we calculate today that are below a certain threshold or below us in terms of incidence uh, and then perhaps also uh, in addition to that are either improving or staying the same. Uh, is going to be different week on week. And that's the nature of the experience of transmission of this disease on, a, on, a, on, a, on, on an international basis. 
I'll put that question to you in a different way. Um, are there countries that you are comfortable with Irish people flying to as of now? So we haven't got to the point where we have that green list, and that green list, when we have it, will be a list of those countries. We don't have that at this moment in time. Okay. And are you comfortable with having a green list this day next week? Do you think that that's too soon, or do you think that this day next week is an appropriate day to have a list of countries? So that's the intention, and we're doing work on a cross-government basis uh, to support by us providing the public health advice uh, any decisions that might be taken to create such a list at the European level. Uh, do you uh, sorry. Yeah, go on. Yeah, um, in Irish level, sorry. Uh, on travel itself, um, we, we had a tweet from Ryanair which effectively said that you've been given, you personally have been given poor travel advice to customers and to people. I, uh, do you have a response to what Ryanair has been saying and how do you feel about a personalised attack on you by an airline? And I don't, I don't have a response. Uh, I have been giving, uh, as we have done collectively um, as an effort, uh, clear public health advice to government uh, through the Minister for Health, uh, and then also making that advice available, I think appropriately and responsibly to the public, so that the public can make informed decisions about their own um, activities, if you like. Uh, and that's the advice that, that, that we've, we've given continually. Um, and just one final one for me to do with the, the pubs, which obviously have reopened, the ones that serve food. There's lots of examples on social media of people buying 30 pints and some chicken wings, and that clearly wasn't the intention where it was to serve a substantial meal. Are, are you happy with the way the pubs reopening has gone and the way some people are treating that reopening? I, I, I've, I've seen some of that social media uh, activity and, and uh, I'm aware of some of those situations. Look, we're, we're still in the very early days of the um, phase three, just past the halfway point in terms of the, if you like, the four phases. Much of the economic, social, uh, cultural activity that is provided for within the phased easing restrictions has now resumed. And if you take that particular one, uh, there are some pubs that have chosen uh, on the assumption, and uh, sorry, on the requirement that they, uh, they are able to provide, if you like, a restaurant style environment to customers for the reason of protecting those customers and for the reason of protecting their staff, that those would, would, would be open. Uh, and I've, I've expressed the view before that we would have an expectation that any of those establishments uh, and, if you like, collective, the collective pubs in general who are operating in that way will be responsible and will behave responsibly in the same way as we've seen across retail, I think, for the most part, a commendable um, responsible uh, approach to applying public health advice and often a lot of initiative and innovation shown on the part of a lot of those retail establishments to protect their staff and to protect their customers. And that's what we expect to see across the restaurants that, that, that are the pubs that are now open as restaurants. I am aware of those sto stories and we're not naive. Uh, and I think we're not at a point yet where we think it's safe for us to say that pubs in general should open. And to the extent that we can be satisfied that this stage in relation to uh, those uh, pub, uh, pubs that have chosen to open as restaurants can do so responsibly, uh, that will be taken into account in our advice that we formulate in two weeks' time in relation to what measures are, are appropriate to take at, 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 at phase four. There can be no given, if you like, that we'll get to a point uh, and that it, no matter what our recommendation or our advice will be. Uh, and I think the public will look at some of these things and will say, and I think we've, 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 we've emphasized this as we, work, we step our way through this, that more and more it will be for you as an individual, understanding the nature of this disease, the risks that apply in relation to it, how to manage those risks, uh, to be able to distinguish between, for yourself between a place that, if, if I can say, uh, looks safe, put your head in the door. Does this look the, like the kind of place that's following the public health advice? It's okay for me to go in, this feels safe, I'm going to be looked after, versus uh, you put your head in the door, this looks like a crowded environment. It doesn't look like the example that you've given of the 30 pints and, and, and a basket of chicken wings, I think you said. Uh, that doesn't sound like the kind of place that's, you know, in the first instance, seeking to protect both the health and well-being of both its customers and its staff. And that's the kind of place maybe you should stay away from. So we're not at the stage of a few pints and a packet of peanuts just yet, then? No. Okay. No. Thank you. Thanks. I did. Uh, just to follow on that, then, the, I mean, is that not a case for the, the, the authorities, the health and safety authorities, to follow places that are, are kind of disregarding the rules rather than for you to say well, you've seen some stuff on, on Twitter and, and you might not allow the pubs to move into the next phase come July 20th? Uh, 
obviously there are, there are appropriately empowered organizations that can take action. We've always said, I mean, from the very first days that we've, we've, we've started to talk in public in relation to this virus, the front line of this is an informed, responsible, responsive public individuals who understand the nature of risk and how to manage their own individual risks and take actions to prevent um, infection. I mean, uh, uh, behind that we have uh, public health measures that are um, about the early identification of cases, the isolation of those cases based on uh, sampling, testing and so on. We have hospital services in place. We have then regulatory mechanisms for overseeing. Uh, we, we have to have in the first instance individuals both informed and behaving appropriately uh, um, and understanding what, it, what, what that means in, in, a, in, a, in a COVID environment, particularly after we've eased restrictions. It can't simply be that, that all of the actions of the regulatory part of the state are the only mechanism that exists to ensure that, that uh, um, all of the environments in which people will you know, find themselves as customers or as clients or, or whatever, or receiving services are safe. In the first instance, if, if, the, if the public don't understand the difference between the kind of environment uh, that, that, that is safe, that's appropriate, that looks like it's protecting and seeking to protect their health, their well-being, and that of the staff who provide their services, then no amount of regulation is going to make up for that. So regulation and the actions of the, the example you've given, the health and safety authority, we have the food safety authority, we have other important regulators in this whole area, uh, are complementary and supportive of uh, an informed public, that they don't replace that. Okay. Sorry, just to go back onto schools, if I could. Um, you were talking about how stable the virus is uh, currently and how I think you said we're in a good position currently at the moment. And on, on the face of it, all those uh, transmission figures seem very low, remarkably low. I mean, if we're not in a position at this point to say to people that they can have a full return to school, when will we ever be in that position? Are you expecting a vaccine before we can tell people they can return to school in a full capacity? As things stand at present, um, the, va the virus is still out there. Schools were closed quite early, clearly, in the course of this. Um, we need to see schools reopening in Ireland. We need to see the course, the trajectory of the disease and the virus following on from the schools opening. We need to see the effect of all of the measures that will be put in place, not just distancing, all of the measures. Uh, and of course, that needs to be balanced with, and that's the job of the Department of Education is there's infection prevention and control advice. There's a whole range of other factors that need to be thought about. Mm. Uh, and it, as we've said for months, we're not the experts in relation to pubs or schools or buses. Or we provide the advice on the public health grounds, but of course we understand at all times there's a whole range of factors that need to be uh, taken into account. But from our perspective, at this point, the virus is still out there. Um, our advice, actually, across society is to maintain two metres physical distance. What we're saying is uh, that in certain situations where other measures are in place, it is reasonable and a pragmatic approach um, to have one metre uh, for children. And beyond that, we're saying that for the younger, the younger children in national school, uh, we're accepting that, that even one metre may not, may not be... Uh, feasible, but that shouldn't preclude them going back to school. But you appear to be saying that without a vaccine, you won't be able to advise or recommend schools to reopen fully in this country. It seems extraordinary. Um, well, a vaccine is, 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 first of all, there's no guarantee that we'll get a vaccine. I think we've stated here previously that a vaccine over the next 18 months would uh, be the fastest produced vaccine in, in, in history. And now, notwithstanding the, the massive research efforts that are going into that, um, a vaccine over the next 18 months is um, it's an ambitious target. Um, we just have to see how we go with this virus. But as things stand, um, and we may learn, as I've said, we may learn much more about children and their role in transmission of this virus over the coming months, particularly both here as children go back to school, but also as we continue to look at the experience of other uh, nations internationally around the issue of children, schools, childcare. And, you know, we will be as pragmatic as possible. Uh, we're not divorced from the real world. We realize the impact of our recommendations. Uh, the guidance as produced yesterday seeks to be as pragmatic as possible. 
given our current understanding of the virus, given our current understanding of disease transmission in the country. Uh, and as I've said, uh, that can continue to be looked at, but we realise that people need certainty. And from that perspective, uh, we're saying that people should plan on the basis of the guidance that was produced yesterday. Right, just lastly, would it be, um, sorry, you were going well, to I just want to, I think we need to be very careful how we think about risk. Mm -hmm. I mean, the risk of encountering the virus right now is low, but if it gets into our families, it's lethal. Uh, your risk of being involved in a road traffic accident is low, but we take all sorts of precautions, safety precautions, to ensure that if you are involved in a road traffic accident, you don't die. So you've got airbags and seat belts. So we need to think about these interventions in that way. There are reasonable ways of reducing the risk of transmission. The risk is low, but if, if we do transmit it, then the onward risk beyond that is, is high. So we, we need to be thinking about something that's low risk but high impact if it happens. Yeah, I, I mean, was there, a, not be fair to say there was an anticipation that at this phase, uh, a testing and tracing regime would have been perhaps more of a key weapon in allowing things like schools to reopen fully rather than we seem to be leaning again on extreme lockdown measures like keeping half children out of school half the week, travel bans. Uh, do we not trust that we can have a testing and tracing regime that can contain the virus at the low levels that's currently at? So, so no testing and tracing regime can interrupt all chains of transmission. So testing, tracing, and isolating is a key component. It's probably for others to other, but just while I'm here, it is a key component of the response, and it will interrupt many chains of transmission, but it won't interrupt them all. And I bring us back to the point uh, that, that, that in certain circumstances, one transmission of this virus can be lethal. So one has to take all the full set of precautions. I've rehearsed again everything from washing your hands through physical distancing, through wearing a mask where it's appropriate, uh, right out to uh, reporting immediately if you have symptoms so that your contacts can be tested and traced. And just to, just to reinforce that, um, I mean, testing and tracing in and of itself doesn't prevent the d transmission. No, I mean, transmission of the virus happens between two people. Testing picks it up after the fact. It allows you to then int put in place interventions that can stop onward transmission for those targeted individuals. It becomes more and more important, of course, when we have smaller numbers of cases that we, we pick those cases up and that we put in place effective control measures around those individuals. But you need to go back to the ECDC guidance, the, the, um, the most recent risk assessment they did. It's about three weeks old now where they set out uh, their, the tenth risk assessment, uh, it was, where they set out a range of measures that they expect to be in place um, in relation to uh, COVID and reducing the, the risks of transmission at a population level, either at national or sub-national level or regional level. Uh, and they included a range of um, uh, measures that apply to physical distancing, to um, um, uh, mass gatherings and things of, of that nature, in addition to having appropriate mechanisms in place for testing and tracing. We can see in terms of our testing and tracing regime that although we're doing large numbers of tests in relative terms, um, and we're doing some targeted testing in particular sectors, we have a positivity rate that continues to fall. So the evidence for us is that we are picking up this infection, uh, but, but in and of itself, having that in is, is, is not necessarily going to present, prevent, it is not a guarantee that you're not going to have transmission of infection or infection appearing. And uh, the key thing for us to be able to do is to pick up that infection, to have a public that's aware of the symptoms, of the signs, and responding, as I said, responsibly and responsibly. Uh, to any symptoms that might uh, that might emerge, and and unless the public comes forward or individuals among the public come forward to say, I have symptoms, I am concerned. Uh, that's that's where it begins. Uh, unless a person comes forward to a GP uh, and, and 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 sets that out to a GP, uh, we don't get the opportunity to test that individual. So testing and tracing is always going to be subservient and secondary to the actions uh, of an informed individual and the actions of an informed public. Hi. Hi, Cleona Russell, Virgin Media News. Just to go back on schools again, I know there was a lot of debate today and you did obviously address it there, but I think a lot of parents are you know, very hopeful that schools will reopen in September. So really I'm just asking how, how realistic do you think that is and exactly what it would look like at, at this time? Do you mind if I maybe just sure. make a contribution on, on, the, on the schools? I mean, I think what we're saying is that from a public health point of view, 
we're saying that there is no longer a reason for us to, to maintain schools closed and we have now provided additional guidance that we see helping schools uh, to understand how best to apply, uh, if you like, measures that can help uh, to limit the transmission and spread of this in school environments. And what the school and education sector now is about is trying to find a means of uh, applying that. The responsibility belongs there, the knowledge and expertise belongs there. We will work in support of them, but I think the work that's been done uh, to give that support to that sector is the development and the publication of the HPSC guidance. And we've had uh, good and extensive engagement with that department to enable them to do it uh, and to implement it. Um, it remains the case with every sector, not just schools, with every environment, that it will be important to take our public health advice uh, and then find ways of internalizing that, put in place the plans, accept responsibility for how those plans will operate uh, in the way in which they deliver whatever service they're responsible for, but be it retail, be it a public service, or whatever it may be, and that there are special or, or particular considerations that we give to those sectors that we will do additional work for and, and develop more, if you like, specific guidance. The education sector is one, and we have done that, and we have published and made available guidance in public that will help that sector. Uh, uh, but they have the expertise now in how to run schools, uh, to run educational institutions and environments, uh, and they've been doing so for many years, and, and, and uh, our guidance will assist them in that. Perfect. And then the other thing I wanted to ask was, obviously we had, I think it was 15 new cases today, and I know over the past, I think if we look back over the past 10 days, the figure of new cases has been 11 or lower, apart from obviously on, on Saturday when it was 23 and Monday when it was 24. So 15 is, is a bit higher again. Are you concerned about that? So um, when we look at the overall trajectory of the disease, and this is what we're saying, that all of the indicators are telling us that in broad terms this is low and for the most part falling, we see a little bit of fluctuation, particularly in the notification date. So sometimes we get notifications and we look more closely at when those, are act when those cases are actually occurring uh, and, and analyze those according to the, the date in which they occur. And I've said this before in these conferences that we look very, very closely at the last 14 days of experience of occurrence of infections. Uh, and we look at those um, in, in this way, we, we're, we, we're satisfied that this remains at a very low and reducing uh, um, ebb, if, if I can put it that way, in terms of the day-to-day um, uh, -day changes in numbers of cases, which isn't the only thing to look at, numbers of ICU admissions, numbers of hospitalizations, uh, and, and any other measure that we think is important in terms of the incidence and transmission of the disease. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Rob O'Hanahan, Joe Duddy, can I ask, um, Scotland today announced they would be making face coverings mandatory in retail outlets from July 10th. Uh, is it something that NEFLA are giving any further consideration to um, here specifically, and if so, how, how is that progress? So we have no specific plan at this point in time to extend uh, uh, advice to making mandatory um, face coverings in, in retail settings in the way that you have uh, suggested is now happening in Scotland. Um, uh, but we keep all the evidence uh, under review. We haven't made a recommendation in relation to mandating uh, face coverings in that environment up to now. Uh, it's been a matter of public health advice. We've emphasized the importance of personal responsibility, tried to raise awareness in as much as we possibly can with your help uh, to get the message out that we want people to wear face coverings in, in, in retail environments. These are the kinds of environments in which, uh, as we go on, uh, it will be difficult for, for us to have assurance that we're maintaining the, the ideal um, um, physical distancing recommendation of two meters. People go into these environments, although like when we go into our supermarkets and shops, we know that they've done a terrific job in, 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 in making arrangements to uh, reduce the, the footfall, so to speak, of people uh, but there will be, within those uh, um, uh, shopping environments, uh, circumstances in which it's not always possible to maintain that two meter uh, a physical distance. And that's the reason we recommend that people wear face coverings uh, in those environments. That continues to be our public health advice. It has been for some time. Uh, we want to see much, much more of it. Going from the uh, MORC research that was published on Monday, um, 36% of males are self-reporting as wearing face coverings. And if they're self-reporting, it's a possibility then that that's not actually the case, and also then the disparity between that and the female figure. Is that a concern, particularly that males in particular seem to be not maybe adhering to that public health advice? So, so we've seen that uh, Amoric research for some time, and, and I suppose I'd say two things about it. So th there's an absolute number, if you like, at any point in time in terms of the percentage of people who say, I am doing whatever, washing hands, etc. So we have no way of knowing whether that's actually... 
uh, and it, there's every possibility that that's, that's not an accurate report in respect of an individual. Um, and we know when we, we reported a figure of 41% a couple of weeks back and it had increased to 46 but that doesn't accord with our own personal experience. When I go into a shop, I don't see 41% of people in those environments wearing face coverings. Uh, but when we see the trend going up, it means whatever the percentage is, I think we can reliably say that whatever the percentage truly is, it probably is increasing in proportion with that, uh, which gives us some degree of assurance, but it's still at a very low level. Um, and uh, um, um, so it's not that we're saying that we believe uh, and we're not living in the real world and we can't see uh, that we continue to see low level of compliance with that in retail environments. We want to encourage uh, every uh, person uh, in any setting indoors in which physical distancing is compromised. And that's usually uh, uh, in retail environments. It's also in, on public transport, which is, wh which is why the decision was made by the government to introduce mandatory um, uh, requirements in relation to that particular sector. We'll keep the whole question uh, under review, but our strong continuing advice is for people to wear face coverings in retail environments. And finally, for myself, there was a report published by JAMA Neurology that said that children with COVID-19 may develop neuro neurological symptoms. Have there been any cases such as that here? I know we had some cases of the PIMS virus, but, but that's, or the PIMS illness, but that seems to have disappeared. Do you want to feed it? Not that I'm aware of, um, but our um, paediatricians are uh, always monitoring our uh, paediatric population for signs, uh, new signs and symptoms associated with COVID-19. But there's been nothing of concern here as of yet? Not that I'm aware of, no. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Ian Begley from the Irish Daily Mail. I've spoken to some teachers and principals today who are questioning whether their entire class or pods will need to self-isolate for two weeks if one of their pupils gets, gets sick and with, with symptoms synonymous to COVID-19. Will, will this be the case? So we have very clear guidance that informs the actions of the public health teams that make assessments as part of contact tracing in how uh, any case is handled and no more than any other part of contact tracing the history of a particular case if it involves a school uh, will be the subject of public health advice by that public health doctor or public health team and that's what will happen in a school environment in the same way as it happens in any other environment okay and just in relation to secondary schools um Again, a lot of uh, principals and teachers are concerned that social distancing won't be possible in larger classrooms in, I suppose, in just a secondary school environment where pupils will have to rotate every 40 minutes or so. And uh, some feel that complacency has set in, especially with younger people. Are there any campaigns put in place directly to target young people to follow the guidelines? So I suppose we have highlighted here the general issue, and not, not applied to the school setting now, but the general issue of the share uh, of cases in total that's represented by people under uh, the age of 35, young people, uh, and raised, tried to raise consciousness uh, around that question. I suppose our concerns are, are, are manifold. Um, we've seen an increase in the number of contacts. We've seen some sm a small number of case reports, if you like, of contacts of young people where very large numbers of contacts were involved in those cases. Um, um, and we have seen some examples of, of um, if you like, non-compliance, and we can see it in our everyday lives. I don't want that to sound in any way like we're blaming uh, people. Uh, I think there's a genuine belief, and obviously in, in a context where we're all uh, tired and frustrated perhaps with some of the restrictions that have been in place for many months now, and uh, this is all very understandable. Um, uh, but there might be a general belief among younger people that because the likelihood of this infection representing a severe illness for me, I don't need to be too concerned about picking this infection up. It's really important to emphasize a couple of things. One, that although the, the risk of it having a severe impact on you as a young person is reduced, as we demonstrated when we had Siobhan Colleen from the Dublin ladies football team with us here on Monday, uh, even elite sports persons at a young age, at the peak of their physical health and well-being, uh, are susceptible to the impacts of this virus and it can have uh, significant health impacts. Um, but also you as an individual, uh, even if the risk to you is minimal, if your illness is mild, if you recover well, you still potentially represent a risk to other people, to other members of your, your family and to your extended family. And, uh, and if your extended family or your family involves people with vulnerable or in, in the various vulnerable groups we've identified as many families do, um, that could have a very
very severe and devastating impact on somebody that's very close to you and somebody that you love. And that's important for young people to, uh, as they do in so many parts of um, um, society, to, to, uh, um, uh, to take on board that message, show responsibility and, and, and support their, not just themselves but their, 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 their families by adhering to the advice we're giving. Okay. And just finally there, would, would NEFIT be appealing to airlines to take a more proactive approach in, in warning passengers about the risk of, of non-essential travel? Um, I think we have very clear uh, advice and guidance in place at the moment in relation to travel. Um, uh, we've made that clear uh, in public. Uh, advisories in relation to travel are made available on a continuing basis through the Department of Foreign Affairs website. It reflects our advice from an, uh, an effort point of view. I've talked already about the work that's happening at a government level that's also happening at a European level to try to find a basis upon which countries can find safe and appropriate ways of, of extending the benefits that come with international travel to, uh, to other countries. Um, and we would hope that all the airlines, just as we would hope intending passengers would, will listen to and follow the advice that we're giving. Mm. And is, is Neffet, Neffet satisfied with airlines engagement so far? Well, we haven't been engaging with airlines and we don't intend to be engaging with airlines. That wouldn't be appropriate. We have a very clear, uh, if, 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 and I've said it out already, uh, um, if you like, two lines of advice. So one is through the minister uh, to government uh, and we advise the minister on a continuing basis in relation to these matters and the minister brings these considerations to government and they're considered just like any other important decision uh, um, by government on the basis of not just our considerations but all the other many, manifold, if you like, commitments that or, or considerations that government need to have. Uh, but our advice is also directed to the general public uh, public health advice for you as an individual about the nature of risk, the things that you can do as an individual to manage your own individual risks, to reduce and minimise those risks, to protect yourself, your family and so on. Uh, and our advice uh, is, is to the public. Um, we don't directly engage in providing advice to the airlines. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Michelle Hennessy from the Journal. .ie. If we can come back to what you were saying there a bit, um, the experience of Siobhan, who spoke earlier in the week, mm. and the, the longer-term impact, health impact that she had. And um, I know, Dr. Glynn, you spoke to us last month about uh, people having trouble getting back to exercise, people in the community who had recovered. So can I ask you to tell us a bit more about what we've learned, even over the last month, um, about the, the sort of longer-term impacts in Ireland, the experience that we've had here, both in terms of people who have been hospitalised and those who've recovered in the community? Sorry, patients who have a, um, a, a prolonged illness, and particularly um, in COVID-19, where there's a hypermetabolic response, so the body starts to consume muscle as a fuel to um, fuel the um, ability to fight off the infection, that that can result in a large amount of weight loss. And we have patients who've lost 12, 18 kilos uh, during their hospitalization, particularly in the critical care unit. So this requires a, a considerable amount of effort in rebuilding strength um, and musculature to be able to uh, mobilize independently again afterwards. So there are significant rehabilitation needs, particularly in people who have um, survived intensive care with COVID-19. Um, but there are other impacts as well. There are um, impacts on the uh, emotional status with reports of uh, patients, and this is true in general of sepsis, of a type of uh, anxiety, uh, depressive disorders, um, you know, flashbacks and uh, you know, anxiety associated with the, the trauma, particularly of being through a, a life-threatening event uh, in the intensive care unit. Um, and of course, um, there in some people with the most severe end of the disease, uh, they can have problems with short-term memory loss and difficulties in concentration that do improve with time, but, but take time and, uh, and uh, care in order to, to give the person the ability uh, to uh, perform at their best possible level. I think, can I ask about people who've recovered in the community, people who didn't need to be hospitalised? The, the numbers of them are the... The, uh, the, the recovery afterwards, the, the longer-term health impacts. That is one for all, yeah. 
So I, th I think in, in general terms, anyone who has a flu or anyone who has a, a significant viral illness, whether they're hospitalized or not, it'll take them a number of weeks to recover. Um, I don't have specific data. We don't track specific data on people in the community and their, and their recovery. But I think anecdotally, we've heard from GPs, we've heard from, from uh, primary care that there are, there are a proportion of people, uh, young, young people, fit people, like we heard from Siobhan the other day, uh, it's, it's, it's not the same as a common cold. You, it's not a given that you'll bounce back after a couple of days. Granted, there's, there's people who suffer no symptoms or very mild symptoms. Uh, but the problem with this virus and the problem with this disease is that for any one individual who gets it, it's unpredictable. You could have a, a very benign disease course or you could end up in intensive care. Uh, and unfortunately, um, we simply don't know enough about the disease at this point to say with any um, certainty uh, for any one individual what that outcome will be. And that's why uh, we still go on about all the precautions that people need to take. Uh, in terms of, of socialising, obviously we've talked about pubs this evening. Um, in other countries, people have been advised uh, as the country opens back up to expand their bubble um, to maybe a small group of people who they could see regularly and that would be a safe way of doing it um, when it comes to socialising rather than seeing maybe five people on a Friday and then five different people on a Saturday and then the following Friday another five different people. Um, do you have any advice in relation to that? And, and in terms of pubs, I mean, how much is, is too much, uh, to, to phrase it that way? Should people limit it to one pub visit or one restaurant visit a week? I think that 30 pints is basically <laughs> was, too, was too much for sure. Um, Ron? Yeah, I, I, we don't have a specific, we've never made a specific recommendation around a bubble, but what we have said is that people should keep their social network as small as possible. The fewer the number of people you meet, uh, the fewer the chances you have of picking up this virus. Um, Many people will have he heard Dr. Motherway earlier, early on in this, um, this, this uh, pandemic discussing the fact that you simply don't know when you meet someone whether they have the virus or not. And therefore, to a certain extent, as she said, you have, you've got to treat them as a pariah. You've got, you've got to take care. Now, thankfully, we've moved to a position for now in Ireland where uh, that's no longer the case. But the reality is, is that given the asymptomatic uh, features associated with COVID. At any point in time, you could be in the company of somebody who's perfectly well, who feels perfectly well, um, but unfortunately, they're in the process of transmitting the virus to you. So one method of reducing that risk is to meet the same group of people on a regular basis and try to keep the overall network that you engage with as small as possible, either um, in your personal life or occupationally. Good evening, Paul Cullen, the Irish Times. Um, Tony, um, insofar as we haven't discussed it so far this evening, um, what did you discuss at your meeting today and what did you decide? I might hand over to Dr. Glynn. I wasn't actually in the chair this morning, you know, so I wasn't, uh -huh. I wasn't present. Um, it was a relatively short meeting uh, today, Paul. Um, the, the, the standing item, I suppose, and the key feature of each NEPIT meeting is the epidemiology. Uh, that's the central... Uh, function of NEPIT. It's to understand the disease, how it's changing, and to ensure that we make decisions robustly, rapidly, decisively, when and if they need to be made. Um, and, and that was the center point for the meeting today. Of course, given that we've seen globally that the uh, disease is accelerating, and we've had uh, over 160,000 cases daily for the past week, uh, again, we looked at the international situation um, and then over and above that, it was just the regular standing items around contact tracing, testing. Um, so there was, no, um, there was no significant actions out of today's meeting. Did you meet the new minister afterwards? And uh, is there anything we should know about that meeting? Yeah, so, so, uh, it was Tracy Conroy, uh, Assistant Secretary here in the department, was in the chair, and she and I both met the minister to brief him on the outcome of the method um, uh, this afternoon. Uh, were there, just, there were no decisions as such uh, from NEPHID, were there, or any, that there were recommendations? There's there? one in relation to ethical principles, uh, which was a, a document which was considered and, and approved for, for adoption, um, but no, there were no, like, it, it, if you like, in the cycle of, of, of meetings, this is the first in the post-phase three, so we initiate a, a set of discussions yeah. today 
which will be further developed next week and will probably be the basis of decisions that are, or advice that will be given in two weeks' time. And that's the kind of cycle of things. So in general terms, that first meeting in the cycle of three tends not to be uh, overburdened with decisions. And uh, on the travel issue, um, you know, there's a risk assessment from the ECDC today. It says uh, the ECDC doesn't consider travel restrictions within and to the Schengen area as an efficient way to reduce transmission. I know we're not in Schengen. We are in the common travel area. As you know, the risk assessment pointed out that the 14-day um, the incidence in the UK is almost 10 times it is here. Isn't, that, isn't the real issue again about the common travel area, isn't it it's that that allows perhaps lots of UK tourists to come here this summer from an area with much higher incidence. It allows uh, American tourists to come through Belfast, uh, the reports of them traveling around Ireland. Um, you know, how can, we do, how can we clamp down on all the other things when we're not dealing with this um, elephant in the room? So um, you're right in what you're saying in terms of the data that's published and that we have access to and that's published by the ECDC also uh, as it applies to the incidents on the island of Great Britain. Uh, we think the experience in Northern Ireland is much closer to the experience here and that from a disease point of view on both sides of the island within both jurisdictions the disease is broadly behaving in, in similar ways and has broadly similar uh, trans transmission patterns. Uh, we have given ongoing consideration to the question of travel. We've provided advice uh, in relation to the measures um, um, that uh, have been considered by government uh, over the course of the last number of months and that's what we continue to do. Um, as things stand, uh, uh, what you're saying is correct in terms of transmission of this virus in, in both um, the, the United Kingdom, specifically on the island of Great Britain, uh, and also in North America. Have you made any, um, any recommendations or expressed any specific concerns in relation to travel from England, I suppose? Um, we have given consideration and provided advice in relation to those matters previously. It's all set out in our previous both minutes and letters to the Minister no additional ones uh, in respect of that today. Right. And just finally, um, any update on mandatory face coverings? Any, any movement on that regulation that was being drawn up? Uh, on the timing of the regulation. I when is it going to Yeah, I don't know the precise date, people, but I know it's very, very close. Uh, and I know there's ongoing work both between this department where uh, the responsibility for the, the SI under the legislation because it's the 1947 Infectious Disease Act um, but it's heavily dependent on work that colleagues in the, um, um, I've slightly lost track of the names of all the departments, you'll have to forgive me, but the involved with the Department of Sport, Transport and Tourism and our colleagues there uh, who, who, who in, in that particular. Okay. Yeah. Right, thank you. Uh, if I may detain you for a minute, um, just slightly unusually, I have a, a personal statement that I'm going to read, if that's all right. Um, uh, from today, um, I'll be taking time out from all of my work commitments to be with my family. My wife, Emer, was diagnosed with multiple myeloma, a form of blood cancer, in 2012. She's had a number of difficult years with her disease and was admitted for palliative care last Saturday. And I now want to give my energy, attention, and all of my time to Emer and to our two teenage children, Cloda and Ronan. I've spoken with the Taoiseach and the Minister for Health today and other colleagues about this, and they've all kindly offered their support and best wishes to both of us. A plan has been put in train for others to take over responsibility for different aspects of my role. The department will issue a statement in due course when that has been finalized. I can confirm that Dr. Ronan Glynn, who has worked alongside me for the duration of this pandemic, has been appointed acting chief medical officer and will chair these press conferences from now on. As a husband and father, and as a public health doctor, I'm conscious that we've been through tough times together over the last number of months, and many families across the country have been affected by the course of COVID-19, suffering pain and the loss of loved ones. I hope that we can all remain working together to continue to stay vigilant, to keep our social distance and take personal responsibility for our own health in the first instance, as well as looking after our family members and friends and those we care about most. I'd like to thank everyone for their ongoing support, understanding and respect for my family's privacy and would ask that this will continue. Thank you.